happy to have Felix Kling. Um, uh, Felix did his master's in Heidelberg and then moved to the University of Arizona to get his PhD and included one year working in Fermilab. And he's now a postdoc in Israel Irvine. Um, Felix has growth um, on a vast, uh, for a vast amount on LHD, quite a different analogy with, uh, with focus on Higgs physics and even included um, applying uh, formation geometry on that topic. But today he's going to do what, the best you can hope out of the theorist, which is to suggest new experiment to look for new physics. And this case is going to be um, a, a LHG signals that are too forward boosted, which would otherwise clearly run under the radar of CMS naturalist. So please. Thank you. That was, I guess, the nicest introduction I, I ever got. Uh, yeah, today I will talk about phaser. Uh, our proposed experiment, the forward search experiment at the LNC. This worked together with my colleagues at uh, Irvine, Jonathan Fink, and Fleger Lawrence, Sebastian Piranowski. We are all theorists, and we had this idea as a result of a coffee room discussion. We talked about uh, cosmic rays and dark photons, and somehow came up with an experiment at the LNC. Uh, we only have three papers about it, um, all theory papers. There will be another one in the next couple of weeks, um, probably more at some point. Um, yeah, let me first give you the rough idea of why are we doing it and what are we doing. Um, and then you basically heard everything. Uh, but then I go into detail and uh, fill up all the gaps. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, this is my rough sketch of the particle physics experiment in space. So we expect that there will be new particles somewhere for various reasons. And we can roughly characterize them by some mass and some coupling to the standard model. Um, of course, if it's light and strongly coupled, we only would have found that. Um, if it's heavy and not strongly coupled, we'll never find it. But somewhere in between, that's where we can probe. And what the LHC is mainly focusing on is the energy frontier, so heavy stuff uh, with relatively strong couplings. Um, that's why, uh, why we built the LHC, that's what Atlas and CMS uh, are designed to look for. This, for example, includes the Higgs boson, uh, decaying into a dark photons. On the other hand, if it's uh, very weakly uh, of a light and weakly coupling, then um, that's what we would call the intensive different here. Um, that typically results due to the weak coupling in some sort of long-lived particles. And the ideal experiment to look for, for this kind of new physics would be spin dump experiment here. So the huge luminosity um, and look for what interesting things comes out of it. Um, the question that we ask ourselves is, can we probe the intensity frontier at the LHC? We already built this amazing machine, can we do more with it? Um, is there something that was flying under the radar so far? Okay, so this is a picture of Atlas, and we can roughly distinguish two regions of phase space, the transverse region and the forward region. And we are mostly interested in the transverse region, because let's say you have the Higgs boson, the decays, approximately isotropical. So if you build a detector in the transverse region where there are not so many pions flying around, then you might be able to find Higgs bosons, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, to give you a rough number of, uh, or yeah, rough number to get uh, the right feeling, we produce uh, around 10 to the 7 Higgs bosons until 300 plus the bond luminosity. So that's within the next couple of years. Um, and yeah, basically, all physics experiments you know are placed in at the LC, are placed in the transverse region like Atlas CMS, and even like proposed searches for long lived particles like Millikan, Methuselah, Codex B are all in this kinematic region. But there's this other one that people typically don't care about, this is the forward region. They don't care about it because there are a lot of pions there. There are uh, the, the inelastic cross section at the LC is 75 microbonds resulting in at the same luminosity 10 to the 17 parts. So if you look for new physics there, you have to somehow dig them out of the big uh, pile of plants, which is considered impossible. That's why no one wants to put an experiment in. Um, there are some standard model experiments, for example, LHCF token alpha um, that are placed there. LHCF, for example, I'll mention later again, looks for um, forward pions, for example. Pions decaying into dark photons, and they would measure the photons in the forward direction. But they are only operating when they have really low luminosity runs, and otherwise take the detector out because they don't want it to be melted by all these forward pions. 
Um, okay. On the other hand, this large number of pions here, let's imagine they decay in a funny way. Uh, let's say uh, one in 10 to the 10 of those uh, pions would decay into some wide weekly couple of particles that might be wrong lists that we still would have 10 to 7 of those guys. So we might uh, uh, produce those new particles uh, in sufficiently large numbers uh, at the LHC already. Um, and I will later mostly talk about dark photons, which might be produced in the case on some sense. The LHC might be a dark photon factory without knowing. Um, give you a feeling about the kinematics. So the transverse momentum of uh, pions is the typical scale you have to think about is one like you see. Um, so if you have high energy pions, you have therefore high energy uh, ion decay products, let's say around the PV scale, then uh, this will typically have an angle with respect to the beam axis uh, of around one like you see. Of energy, this gives you uh, milliradians. So we could have a very focused, high energy beam of interesting new physics along the uh, beam axis in the forward direction. So our idea is, we all eventually, the LHC curves, um, so you can put along the beam line on the tangent to the LHC ring, you put a small and expensive detector, maybe a cubic meter volume, and just see if some of those particles might decay in them. And then, as I said, it's high energetic if it goes so forward. So you might have a very high energetic dielectron signature somewhere in some side tunnel in the LHC. That would be a very slight signature for new physics. And both we call that phaser forward uh, such experiment at the LHC. OK. Phaser, you might have heard before the term. It also recalls uh, the acronym recalls another marvelous instrument that harness highly collimated particle was used to explore strange new worlds. Um, of course, I'm referring to Star Trek. Here's a picture, it's a phaser, it's this gun here. And, uh, Jonathan took a picture in the Star Trek Museum. Um, well, if you're young and didn't watch Star Trek like me, uh, phaser also had appearance in another uh, popular culture show, uh, The Big Bang Theory. Uh, we talked to just by uh, coincidence, we talked to the science advisor of the Big Bang Theory, and he liked our idea, and his job is to fill all those whiteboards that are standing around everywhere with some random formulas, and then he decided to put our formulas on those boards. Um, Jonathan was even at the set. Uh, here you see them in the kitchen of the Big Bang Theory studio, and uh, yeah, if you watch this episode, it's on end of November last year, you will see our formulas on the white post for at least two seconds in that episode. Jonathan didn't make it in the cameo for the episode. No, I mean, they, he actually came after they already uh, did the episode. So okay. it was between him and the formula. Oh, it's just formula. It's just the formulas. And then you really have to zoom in on this one here. Yeah, in this little box there, you can do phaser. Okay. Let's talk about physics again. So, and I'll first talk about where would you actually put this experiment. So, does the LHC provide the right infrastructure? And the answer would be yes. Um, then I will give you one physics example, dark photons, which is what we first thought about. And this will tell you how physics actually, in a lot of points, works in favor of this idea of working. And uh, also tell you about what detector do we need, what are the backgrounds, how well do we do also in comparison to other experiments. And then we also investigate a bunch of other models, um, which each give us a little bit uh, more insight into how a detector should be designed. Um, and then I will conclude. I'm not sure how much time I will have here, depending on how much questions you ask. I'd rather have you asking a lot of questions than me talking. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any stage when you have questions. Uh, especially in this part here with the backgrounds, uh, typically the talk turns into a discussion because everyone thinks like, how oh, about this background, how oh, about this background? And it will be a lot of fun. Okay, infrastructure. Well, at leading all that, the LHC is a ring, and next to leading all that's not a ring anymore. It consists of straight parts, which are shown here in blue, called intersections, and curved parts called arcs. Each of the straight parts is around 550 meters long, and our experiments, Atlas and CMS, are placed in the center of 
of those uh, intersections. There will be a small crossing angle I will mention later because the, well, the beams, if you make them exactly parallel, then they also collide away from the Atlas and CMS experiments, so you lose a lot of luminosity there. You don't want to do that, so that's why they have a slight angle so that they only intersect in Atlas and CMS. Uh, this is actually subject to changes still, especially for high luminosity LNC, and maybe phaser can even provide some physics motivation to uh, choose certain values or at least orientations. Um, so let me zoom in a little bit. So this is again my approximate drawing of the forward uh, infrastructure at the LNC. And here it starts with an interaction point, that's where everything happens. And then 20 meters later, there's something called the pass. It's basically a copper cube with a little hole in it where the beam goes through and it's supposed to absorb everything that's a little bit off axis um, to protect all those magnets um, later. There's a lot of shielding at the LHC because you have a lot of magnets that you don't want to heat up with, uh, with a bunch of pions and muons and photons going into it, especially when they're superconducting. Okay, then there's quadruple core magnets which generally focus the beam and uh, clean the beam and uh, yeah. Um, and then there are dipole magnets to deflect it. And you can see that basically everything that's low energy, like below TV scale, couple TV scale, will be already deflected by this very first magnet here. So no muon, no pion, no proton will make it until here. It's less than, well, in this case, 0.5 TV ish. Um, here, this is a tons of target neutral absorber. Um, and this is after the beam is already split sufficiently um, to absorb all the forward going neutral particles, mainly uh, photons and neutrons, to again protect all the magnets that are behind it. And then there's a series of more magnets, dipole magnets, quadrupole magnets, uh, basically between here and here, everything is full of magnets. Um, and then the, uh, the beam starts to curve, so there will be uh, even more dipole magnets all around the curved part of the, of the LHC ring. And you can imagine to, uh, because all the dark photons, would they go in a straight line to put an experiment like phaser right here, uh, where the beam is already, uh, the tunnel is already curved enough, and uh, you don't provide, uh, or you, your, um, the experiment wouldn't uh, overlap anymore with the LHC infrastructure itself. Okay. Um, this entire uh, uh, infrastructure here for us has a great advantage. It acts as a natural filter in the forward direction. All these uh, absorbers and magnets should make sure that there are no uh, particles going into the direction of phaser anymore uh, at this stage. Um, also keep in mind there will be like uh, 100 meters of rock or 50 meters of rock at least at this stage where particles would have to go through the phaser. Okay, so let's place phaser approximately here. Um, the question is where do we need to dig a tunnel? We probably don't want to dig any tunnels. So, so we looked at the drawing of the LHC. This is an artist version. So hmm. we need to have a, some sort of tunnel that goes outwards from the ring. Zoom in a little bit to the Atlas side. You see, okay, you have this tunnel here. It's called TIAT. Uh, so this is the SPS ring. This is the LHC ring. And this TIAT was a connector between uh, SPS and where there was still left. Um, for whatever reason that I don't know, this tunnel was not sufficient anymore for the LHC, so they built a bigger one. Um, but this one is still there. And uh, it looks like the, the uh, beam lines of the tension to the Atlas experiment would actually go right through this tunnel. So we investigate a little bit further. This drawing doesn't tell you anything. So we actually got some tunnel maps. We need to find people at CERN who would like to give us their tunnel maps. But OK, this is actually from the, from the time when they planned lab. So this is like, I don't know, 80s or something, way before I was born. Um, so here is the, the LHC tunnel. This is the side tunnel here. And there's actually a, um, a sun cavern there, even with connection to the, um, to the surface. Um, and Okay. Mike Lamont, who has been incredibly helpful for our project, um, he simulated where the beam line would go. And this is the same drawing here. Here's the LHC tunnel, and here's the 
uh, the side panel, and the beam line goes right through the side panel here, about five meters away from the actual beam. Um, and uh, yeah, this would be the place where you would uh, want to put taser. Okay, it seems like you have all of five to ten meters space here to, to put phaser. Um, but yeah, you might still worry of what is what is here. Map, so maybe there's stuff standing around the side panel. Maybe it's a security exit, and we're not allowed to put anything in the security fire uh, way. Well, he went down there. That was last December after it turned down and took some pictures. So this is standing in this, this cavern there. Uh, here you see the LC, and here you see the side panel. And you see, okay, there's not really standing anything there. That's good. We were a little bit surprised, but it's all good. Um, another thing you realize is. About the, this is a little bit higher than the than the ring, so uh, actually the the beam line goes very close to the surface of the of the walls, this tunnel. That's not really a problem because this is all just concrete that has been built in. But uh, okay, just to keep it in mind, we went a little bit further to another picture. This one here, and you see right here. That's where we would want to put phaser, and yeah, maybe we have to take on the, the plates from the ground, we have the accelerator section and the, uh, like the infrastructure section, they said, oh yeah, that's no problem, this is all just concrete, that would take us a couple of hours to take that out. So if you have any reason to want us to do that, that's no problem. Uh, it just can't go deeper than maybe half a meter because there are water pipes there. Um, okay, then you see there's a door. Huh. We're still worried about the, uh, the security access. So he went there and took a picture of the door and here it's really door definitely closed. Cannot be used as emergency exit. Okay, so there's a fire behind you. You might not like to read that, but for us it's amazing news. No one will ever want to go there. Wait. Okay. So we have a place to put phaser in this side panel there. Why is the door there? For lunch. <laughs> it's definitely closed. <laughs> Was, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we then went to the actual accelerator section. So there are people who have a complete 3D model of the tunnel system in the LHC, and uh, they read it, what Mike did, uh, simulated. Where does the beam line actually go? Where would our dark photons be? And the dark photons would be here, you see them from above, and here is like, yeah, zoomed in the, uh, in the uh, yeah, this is the intersection there. You see it goes right through this tunnel here. So it would be like one meter more in that direction. That would be really nice. And we could also use this UJ18 cavern. But OK, we have to look at this here at least for now. Maybe if it turns out that uh, yeah, if we can convince people that this is a really great idea, we might be able to convince them to dig a little bit here. Taking out concrete is not such a big problem. But here, they would have to go into the water, which is a bigger problem. But keep in mind on the CMS side, they have a almost billion dollar tunnel digging uh, project uh, for the, uh, not the next long shutdown, but the one before high luminosity LHC. So digging is in principle not not impossible. You just need to convince them that it was. Okay, and digging a little bit here would not be a billion dollar. But yeah, let's not even think about that. Let's just think about the side tunnel here. It's a little bit inclined, but again, keep in mind that take out the ground a bit and then we have at least three meters. So it's depending on the, the beam crossing angle I mentioned earlier. If that goes downwards it's bad, if it goes upwards it's great. So we have between three and five meters space to put an experiment like phaser. As you will see later, that will be sufficient at least for the dark photon model. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so now we have a place where to put it. Um, what physics can we do with it? And why does it even Okay, let me motivate first why, why we think about dark photons. I already said dark photons a couple of times, but of course no one really cares about dark photons. Everyone cares about dark matter. We know or strongly believe that there's something like dark matter there, and um, well, our generic explanation goes like this, okay, we to get the right uh, abundance of dark matter, um, well, you use thermal freeze out, and you get the right abundance if you have weak scale couplings, and, uh, and uh, weak scale masses for your radiator and dark matter scale. Okay. 
Um, and people look for that. That's why we built Xenon and LZ and all those other detection experiments that all have bond mask. So that has motivated theorists to think a little bit broader. Let's call that so this is a RIMP. Let's call it the broader RIMP. If we make the masses smaller and the coupling smaller, we still get the right value of abundance. Um, okay. Here with the, with the weak scale masses, we have obvious mediators, the X and the Z, which have weak scale masses. But if we go much below, we need new mediators. Okay, so we could introduce new mediators. We probably introduce a, some sort of dark sector which contains the, um, the dark matter. And the obvious portals that people think about is just a green you know, and white terms you could write down. For example, a dark photon portal, where you have some broken UN gauge field mixing with the, uh, with the photon field, or some dark Higgs photo where you have a new scalar and then you can write down this uh, coupling token. Or you could have a sterile neutrino, which is of course motivated on its own. Um, you could have axions and you probably have much more. And then of course you can make this here as complicated as you want. Okay, let's talk about this one. This was the first on the list, so let's talk about it. Um, Okay, uh, it, dark photons generically appear when you have a broken uh, dark V1 gauge group. So then you would, can write out it's broken, you write out a mass term, and uh, uh, yeah, you can write this down this mixing term here, as long as you don't have a symmetry for building it. Um, and you don't like this term here typically, so you just redefine your fields uh, and rotate this here away from the uh, field strength tensors into the uh, coupling with the fermions, and then you get an effective coupling of the dark photon field to the standard model fermions proportional to the electric coupling suppressed by this factor epsilon here. Okay, but you still have the master. And in the theory, everything is described by two, two, uh, two parameters. This parameter epsilon here, which is coupling modifier, and uh, the mass. And this is shown here. Everything that's gray is excluded. And there are basically two types of searches, prompt searches. So if the dark photon decays very promptly, you can use uh, all the experiments we have. The main uh, 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 bounds come from, let's say, B factories um, up here. And this goes approximately to epsilon of 10 to the minus 3-ish. And then you have those uh, bounds here where the dark photon starts to be long lived, and then you have all your beamed up experiments from the 80s and later. And there are several new experiments uh, designed to, to probe this parameter space. You see all prompt uh, types of searches and uh, you know, all these place types of searches. Uh, what phaser aims to probe is this region here. Um, and you will see our reach plot later. So our couplings are 10 to maybe 500 MeV and, uh, and suppression factors epsilon from 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6, where the dark photon is long um, Why do we really care so much about this region here? Well, with my uh, dark photon mediated dark matter story, uh, you would actually expect some sort of um, dark photon to be somewhere in this region here. So somewhere between our uh, bounds from, uh, from beam dumps and our prompt bounds. So we kind of want to close this gap. Also, if you have heard about the beryllium access at uh, uh, Hungarian, on the Hungarian group, we claim to have an access that points towards a weakly coupled particle at 17 MeV. Uh, that would roughly sit here. This is also not excluded. So there are a couple of reasons to uh, to look for for these types of models. And dark photon is just the simplest thing you could write down. You said you said you expected to be somewhere yeah, this to, to get the relevant one. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Remind me what assumptions go into the relevant ones. I think not much more than what I've written down here. Right, so, um, heavier masses give you larger couplings, yeah. right? Um, and this is what, uh, this line here is uh, yeah, basically this power law scale in here. Um, maybe I should have put it in there. <laughs> yeah. 
it's I just a rough one. It's someone else's fingers. Someone else's fingers. You have to take it serious, but yeah. Yeah, well, I think in that white paper you're referring to that, that, that those lines are in that figure in one figure. Okay. In one of the figures. Yeah. Not in this one. Yeah. This yeah, seems yeah. to be old anyway. I mean, those, those, it's from last uh, summer, right? But uh, I remember that all those lines should actually look different. So I don't know why they took this figure. Um, okay. So how could we produce dark tones on that phaser? Well, there are a couple of, of, uh, of ways we could do that. Uh, if it's light enough, we can produce it in meson decays. And this is what I will do throughout this talk because it's conceptual decays. If it's heavier, also branch stratum, or dark foot on branch stratum uh, will be important. Then. If it would be very heavy, we could, in principle, consider just gradual production of dark photons. We tried to calculate it and failed because these PDFs are not known that we would need. We would need more matter fractions of 10 to the minus 8, and those have not been measured yet, so we better don't do any predictions there because it's different PDFs. You see, but two hours of making two different results, so you shouldn't believe anything in any way. So. But this is maybe uh, uh, motivation for future work at, uh, at PDFs. So let's talk about high energy case. Um, well, what we will do is we simulate what's the pion spectrum, decay those pions and dark photons, and then see how many of those decay in our detector. And uh, we'll turn out, we will have a sizable number, and then we ask ourselves, okay, what detector do we need to be able to detect those dark photon decays? So first thing is we need the pion spectrum. Well, we'll show that a couple of times. So the spectrum I will always show is the momentum versus the angle with respect to the beam axis. Um, and this is all log scale, and the color coding shows uh, the number of events in each bin, and it's five bins per decade uh, in each direction at 300 inverse time to bound luminosity. The one thing you can see is, at least for this uh, generator here, that even in the very forward direction, let's say below one uh, milliradian, at very high energies, TV energies, let's say here, you still have four, 10 to the 15 pions going in this direction. That's a huge number. So that's something to work with. Um, there are several forward physics models, and um, a couple of years ago, before the LHC turned on, uh, they were they did not agree. They had like they didn't even know will there be an average five pions or hundred pions. Uh, they just didn't know. But then, after LHC and LHCF turned on, they, they actually had the data, so they just had to fit the spectrum into the data, and this is basically what all of them do. They use LHCF, alpha, and so on data, uh, and match their prediction to it. Um, and that also tells you it will get better with time, and those experiments also collect more data and uh, do more uh, refined analysis. How can we understand the spectrum? Um, it's centered around this line here, and this is transverse momentum, this lambda QCD, and I told you earlier, this is a PT scale we would have expected anyway. So in this sense, our result makes sense, and those models just describe us how it's smeared around. Um, and yeah, as I said, there's a huge number of those lines. Uh, let's see here. Um, branch diffraction in dark photons is up to some phase space factor, just two epsilon squared. Um, so even if we have very large coupling stems of minus five, let's say, then we could still have, let's see what we're talking about, uh, 10 to the eight dark photons produced, a huge number. Um, so in some sense, dark, uh, the LHC is a dark photon factor. Here I show the spectrum of uh, dark photons. Um, we have momentum and angle again. And you still see that you have uh, uh, very, well, this benchmark point here is that's something to minus five, and mass and E. And you still have very large numbers of dark photons, even in the very forward direction. Um, okay, then the question is where do they decay? The typical uh, decay length you can calculate it is for, let's say, 100 MeV particle with mixing of 10 to minus 5 and energy of a TV, it's around 18 meters. That's not too far away from uh, where we want to place our experiment. Our experiment is site come out to be 480 meters, so it's the same order of magnitude. Um, from this plot, you can already learn that to have a decay length of well, all of magnitude 480 meters, you need energies in the TV scale, um, plus minus all of magnitude. Um, 
that also tells you that those particles are typically very forward and small angles, which is great because it tells you you only need a very small detector um, and not a big one. Okay. Yeah. Is this plot ends because there are no pines or because you couldn't measure them? Uh, this plot ends here because we can't have pions with energy above 6.5 TB. And uh, in principle, it never ends in this direction, but yeah, this is it's basically a Gaussian smearing in, uh, around this center line here. Okay. Right, in principle, you could have a pion that's exactly going in the direction of the beam line. Uh, just that it's longer with the size of the pins is, uh, decreases uh, or exponentially. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's ask how many of them actually decay within the detector volume. And here I consider a 3 meter long detector with yeah, 20 centimeter radius corresponding to an angle here of uh, uh, like half a milli radian. Um, yeah, at 400 meters away, yeah, 400 meters, away, 480 meters away from the detection point, so there's a side from this. And okay, we basically have to regrade the plots that I showed for now by some exponential factor describing the proportion of decay in this volume. Um, and you see that what I said earlier is exactly what happens. You have uh, only high energy particles at this very small angle with respect to the z axis decaying. So if you build a detector like this here, you can basically capture all of them. Okay, that's good. Any questions so far? If not, then we ask ourselves, what does the detector need to be? Okay, the dark photon, it's 100 MeV, it only decays into electrons. 200 MeV, also into muons. Uh, well, 10 MeV then into muons. So maybe later also pions, kaons, whatever you want. But the, the fraction of the electrons will always be all one. Um, okay, so our signature is two oppositely charged energetic tracks with very high energy, 500 energy in BU, approximately. Uh, some sort of vertex inside the detector volume, so at least there are no tracks coming from outside, uh, tracks not inside the detector. The combined momentum points roughly back towards the interaction point. Okay, so. Since we have a, a charge track signature, we saw well, how about having a tracking based technology? Um, the opening angle for, for this sort of energy here is roughly, okay, let's say you have the TV energy here and the 180 particle here, that's about 100 milli radians. So after made, uh, one meter, it's uh, 100 uh, uh, micrometer uh, distance between the two tracks. So we need an alternate good tracking system, good resolution. And we talked to some tracking experts and they said, well, let's take this Alice technology and we still had some of the ships lying around uh, and send it as a picture of it. Um, they have 20 micrometer pixel size. They're relatively cheap, cheaper than Atlas, mainly because they are not radiation hard, but they shouldn't be radiation hard. If that's really a concern, then there are probably too many backgrounds to worry about anyway. We look for rare events here, so this should not be a problem. I have a reasonable time resolution here. Um, a little bit worse than, well, all of make it be worse than the Atlas ships, but I don't think that will be a big issue. Okay, then you say, hmm. if you really worry about the splitting of the tracks, then you can say, hey, let's put a magnetic field in, which was the original reason why we wanted to put it in. Uh, so it provides additional splitting. It also does something else. It allows us to, um, uh, to have a rough energy measurement. Let's say well, uh, 0.1 Tesla field will not really give you much, but it tells you whether the TV or a GV. That's a good thing we do. Um, so yeah, we can get a very rough energy resolution. Um, and so at least 0.1 Tesla, you can uh, also get this conventional magnets, maybe you can learn magnets. So certainly nothing superconductor. Um, okay. This was our proposed detector. I'm sure our experimentalist will, will change everything I said here. But uh, um, yeah. in principle, you could also say, hey, you add an uh, e-call there. This gives you an energy measurement uh, and helps you distinguishing electrons from muons, for example. Um, 
and then maybe you don't even need the magnets anymore or, or also maybe it's better to have better pixel size and a larger magnet it's, we don't know, I'm, I'm a serious, I don't know what's the best uh, technology to use here, what's the cheapest, uh, what's the best to maintain, and what's the power consumption, and yeah. So, I don't know, this is uh, still subject to change, but uh, I hope I convinced you that in principle we would be able to, uh, to detect such a signature here. Okay, how about backwards? Again, this is the signal we are looking for, um, and yeah. Most backgrounds, well, there might be a bunch of charged tracks going through the detector, but not every charged track will be a background. Um, actually, the number of uh, charged tracks should not be so high. It's not what you typically have at Atlas or, LA, uh, or CMS. Um, everything from the interaction point should be either bent away by the magnets in the charge, um, or the, the absorbers and the surrounding rock should provide enough shielding so that uh, nothing from the interaction point should arrive at the detector. It's not really nothing you could imagine. If one muon makes it in a weird way through all the magnets and ends up in our detector. But this is this is unlikely. When you say the, the typical background you would worry about is cosmic rays, but they come from up there our well, signal comes from over there, so that clearly has a wrong directionality. We know everything from above can, can never be a signal. Um, so we saw the power two types of backgrounds, everything that's neutrino induced, of course neutrinos make it to our detector, and beam induced backgrounds, so something that comes from the LHC infrastructure, possibly closer to our experiment. There's still the LHC beam five meters away from phaser, Maybe it collides with the gas, or there was some only slightly deflected proton that goes to phaser, then hits the beam pipe, and then has some secondary showers, and they would make it into phaser. So let's first talk about um, neutrinos. Um, here we, yeah, when neutrinos, it's actually a good mixture of all three neutrino types. Um, here we mainly consider neon neutrinos from pion decay, but uh, most uh, pions do not decay before they reach the first magnet, especially for the analyses we are considering here. Um, actually, only for 1% decay. Um, so you get a substantial uh, contribution also from heavier mesons, mainly D mesons. Uh, so you also have the other neutrino pions. But let's also put the interesting of those here. Um, and if you just calculate the, the number of charge current events with where the neutrino has an energy above 100 GeV, and uh, we did that for, I think this is also 300 in those factor bond and per kilogram of detector. Um, then you see that you get, uh, yeah, here depending on what the, the minimum energy of the neutrino is supposed to be, you see that uh, it's for about 100 GeV, it's for like 10 events per kilogram. That doesn't sound too bad. And then again, one muon is not a background. Our uh, signal is two simultaneous tracks, not one. Okay, uh, this is already pretty low, then requiring, for example, an additional uh, pion being produced with it. Um, that reduces this event rate by another two hours of magnitude, so this would be like 0.1 events for, uh, per kilogram uh, for uh, requiring the neutrino to be about 100 GeV. Okay, this certainly sounds controllable. And then there are all sorts of kinematic features that where neutrino interactions would be different than our proton decays. For example, if you have this sort of signature here, you would naively expect that the, uh, here I show the energy ratio of the energy of the uh, uh, softer particles respect to the harder one. And uh, in this scenario here, the pion only has maybe like 5% energy fraction of the muon, where for the signal here, they typically have around the same energy. So, completely different kinematics. So if you really worry about that, there are many handbooks to, to deal with it. Okay, how about um, uh, even just backgrounds? Well, calculating those is of course really hard. Actually, you shouldn't trust anything, any number I will say in the next two minutes on the slides. This is all like, not made up, but it's, I don't use like, the real numbers I should use here because they are not available. What, you, what we 
actually doing right now is we ask the uh, accelerator section, so those people who do all the simulations uh, uh, to get all the fluxes of particles at various points in the LXC infrastructure, they mostly care about what's a muon flux and uh, is it too dangerous for my superconducting magnet. Um, and they can also calculate the muon flux and phasor, for example, and they are doing this. And they will tell us what it is, and this is something that I would believe much more than this year. Um, but the best thing to do, of course, is to just put a prototype in there or something that can measure fluxes. Um, and uh, well, then we know what the backgrounds are. It just measures them. Um, but just to give a rough feeling, okay. Uh, the particles coming from the IP or even from the, uh, from the beam still have to pass through, through rock. So you can only uh, learn from that that mainly muons are relevant here. Um, yeah, nuclear interaction cross section is 20 centimeters or something. So even if it has to pass uh, through like 10 meters of rock, if it's produced like 10, 20 meters away from phaser, it most likely got fully absorbed. Um, okay, so let's worry about muons uh, as our our main concern for now. Um, the muon flux measured by atlas from beam induced background, so what they did is they did not let the beams collide and then just saw how many muons come from outside into our muon system and they got a meter away from the beam approximately or more than a meter, so not too close. They, they got the flux of around 10 to the minus 3 hertz per square centimeter. Don't take this number of the series. It's going into Atlas and not away from Atlas, which is what we care about. So the fluxes there are probably different, but um, it gives you a rough feeling for what all of are we talking about. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's calculate the rate of two of those muons produced arriving at phase at the same time, and you get okay. Don't take this number of the series either. On the previous slide, I showed that it should be. Nanosecond and not that picosecond, but they have like all the like one ish coincident muon pairs in one LXC here. Okay, that does not sound too bad, and I did not even consider to put some vetoes there and to use all the kinematic features we have. For example, two random muons will most likely not reconstruct the vertex anywhere close to the detector volume. They probably go one this way, the other one this way, and this is not the dark okay, you know. Um, so yes, this made us believe that um, we, uh, yeah, we are probably um, the, the backgrounds could probably be under control. I'm sure if you think hard enough about it, you will find uh, things that I didn't mention here. Let's say k on decays, k on decaying into uh, a neutron hitting the nucleus in the rock, producing a k on close to phaser, which travels to phaser and looks like it come from the interaction point, decays in phaser into a charged ions or something. Of course that can happen, but I can't calculate it, and I can also tell you various reasons why this should be small. And we went through all of that, also with experimentalists. And we at least got some so far that they said, yeah, let's at least do a proper calculation here and maybe even measure it. Um, then we will know. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves whatever is left over, how do we need to design a detector to make sure that it's really background free? But I believe we can make it background free if we design the detector this way, in a way so that it will be background free. Okay. Then, um, okay, let's uh, talk about the signal rate. And here with signal rate, I mean number of decays in volume. Um, so the main final states we would have to consider, at least for this plot here, here again show the mass and the, the coupling uh, would be the case of the electrons, muons, and pions. These are all charged particle final states, so tracking based technology should be fine with it. Um, and here I show three contributions, pion decays, eta decays, rush strong. Uh, this is for a three meter detector, two meter long, 20 centimeter wide. Uh, um, the, yeah, in the side panel at 480 meters. Um, and yeah, you see, and this will be the same for, for basically all models you could possibly consider. If you, at some point, in high couplings are limited because uh, your particle would decay before reaching the experiment. 
and this is some exponential effect. And you see there is a these um, these contour lines showing the number of events, uh, three, ten, hundred, thousand, ten thousand. They are very close to each other. That also tells you that in this region of perimeter space here, that we actually care about factors of two don't really matter. The only have factor of two acceptance and. Even if you go a factor 10 down in luminosity, you go from this red line to this red line here. This is barely change. So yeah, I made the same plot with, uh, uh, with 30 inverse factor bound luminosity. It basically goes down to, to uh, this line here. I think I have a lot of slides. Um, so yeah, even with 30 inverse factor bound luminosity, you can probe some term unconstrained parameter space. That's amazing. Um, it's a, uh, a very small carbon down here, of course, eventually you're limited by not producing drug photons in the first place. And then you, then you okay. How do we compare to other experiments? And here, of course, you also ask all sorts of physical questions. Um, this uh, yellow shaded region is phasor, and the bluish regions are uh, what LACD will be able to do, and they're of course much closer to the interaction point, so they probe much prompter decays. Um, and they can actually do very well. But uh, yeah, um, we are probing the smaller couplings than what LACD can typically do, um, just because we are more far away and we have way more uh, along the dark photons. We have some overlap with. Uh, uh, ship and Seacrest. A um, few comments about them. And uh, so Seacrest is a deep lab experiment at Fermilab that's designed to measure some Seacrest PDFs. Um, don't take this line serious. It was an early study where they thought, oh, they look for muons. And uh, if there are further in case the muons here, then we could potentially only use the data they have. So the new study showed that the state management was wrong because they also have a lot of muons in general from backgrounds. So you will not be able to see dark photons decaying into muons in sequest. They think about upgrading it with an eCal, and they got even promised an eCal, but they don't have it, and it's not clear that Formula really wants sequest to go on. And uh, because they use beam time, and they would rather use their beam time for some muon experiments or neutrino experiments. So the, the political status there has a big question mark behind it. Also, they really need an upgrade, which they don't have yet. Um, so yeah, we don't know what happens. But you we don't use stop pion limit, stop pion experiments limit, uh, like a coherent type of like a where, where people have used like a pion to dark matter and dark matter scatters of the detector. So there is a paper by Schumacher, like a, uh, I think a couple of Wait, months Wait, pion goes to dark matter? Yeah, because pion decays to dark matter and that dark matter gets uh, coherently scattered from but here in this permit, like a uh, you have dark matter, so I mean that would be a different model, right? Like a dark photon. Pion decays to dark photon. Ah, and yeah, dark yeah. This is exactly what we consider here, yes. Yeah, yeah but there is a uh, stop pion limit, like a coherent experiment, for example. Stop pion limit. Yeah, yeah. They use the stop pion, and then the pion produces this dark photon. Dark photon gets scattered of the detector. So that's the experiment. I see. But so it's uh, called coherent. And this Ian Shoemaker actually wrote a paper on that. I forgot their limit on epsilon versus MA parameters. Yeah. That's like What's it last month. Yeah, like last month or it might be. Okay, I might have seen it. There was one paper which extends parameter space down here, mm -hmm. which didn't even make it into a plot. And there was another one where well, I already forgot what the result was. Let's look again later. Um, yeah, the other experiment, so ship you have to take with a grain of salt. But okay, I have to admit, if you really care about dark photons, and only dark photons, just pay for an upgrade for uh, for Seacrest and let it run another year. You can probably do that. There's no need to. Dark photons alone are not enough physics space to really well take that. There was just one model. Uh, so, uh, and then there's ship. Ship will have a great reach. There are two things I want to say about it. One, that it's about 100 times as big, 100 times as expensive, and well, not 100 times better, but better. Um, actually, not in the region of parameter space we care a lot about, like here. Um, that has a simple reason, like all those experiments are very similar, because it's purely defined by um, what is the decay length uh, for the typical decay lengths versus what is the distance between detector and, uh, and 
action point. And so k length is basically given by uh, by the um, by the energy, the energy scale of the uh, energy scale of the beam. And those ratios here, length between the action point detector and energy scale of the beam, is the same for ship, sequest, and phaser up to a factor of two. So we are of course much more far away, but we have uh, six point five TeV energy while uh, um, Sequest, for example, is only over five meters away, but therefore has uh, has only like 120 GB uh, beam energy. So they are very similar in uh, both sector sectors. Also, ship uses these uh, uh, direct production, so really young goes to dark photon, and we're interested. We can talk about it later, but I believe they did. Um, so I wouldn't trust anything that's here with ship. But. Okay, but yeah, just dark photons, probably not the uh, reason to, to build phasers, so we need more physics space, let's skip over that here. Uh, we looked at more models, and we will continue looking at more models. One model would be dark things, okay? We have a Lagrangian like this, this is some sort of effective Lagrangian after you redefine all the fields, you like it, some of the and so on. And um, okay, it's described by mainly two parameters, its mass, and again, some sort of mixing angle. Um, so the dark uh, Higgs uh, gets the Higgs mixing to Fermi, or Higgs couplings to Fermi, and suppressed by a factor of theta. Okay. Um, it's uh, mainly produced in heavy meson decay, again, because heavy mesons have stronger couplings to, uh, uh, to the Higgs. Um, and one big difference here is that heavier mesons have a different PT spectrum than pines. The typical PT is around uh, the B meson mass. Um, that tells you to really probe this, you ideally want to have a bigger detector. So earlier I talked about 20 centimeters, actually 5 centimeters would have been enough for dark photons. Here you almost want to have a meter to, to really <coughs> capture all the dark Higgs you produce. Um, Okay, so in this sense, to, to measure the dark X is more a sort of long-term goal. Uh, also, you want to probably benefit from the full power of the LHC, have a high luminosity. Um, you also, when you look at the case, you get a, get a full spectrum of the case. Um, not only electrons uh, are important, like with a dark, uh, dark photon case, there, if you only do the electron channel, you're probably fine. Here, the case into whatever is every state possible, so electrons, muons, or pions, or kaons, and eventually well, all the uh, yeah, CC tau tau states. Um, so yeah, you probably would also need a broader spectrum of, uh, of searches here. Um, you still have about two thirds, roughly, a prime infection of the shot states, so our general approach of having tracking-based uh, technology shouldn't be so bad, but you might even want to do, uh, look for, for other things that are okay. three particles or four particles in a final state. <coughs> Interesting thing is, I didn't mention that earlier, but here is another term that we can write down. It's a coupling between the Higgs and the uh, and that, uh, new light scalar. Um, and this would correspond to invisible Higgs decays, for example. But you could also measure that. Uh, uh, this diagram here, we produce an offshell X that then decays into um, two of those light scalars. You could constrain uh, this with pressure minus a phaser, um, and you would get some, some limits on, on the, at the end, invisible branch infection of the Higgs. You can say you can, on the one hand, constrain the invisible branch infection of the Higgs, at least in the context of this model. On the other hand, you can say, hey, what is if we observe something here? Then you might even to be able to, to probe it uh, at phaser. So if Atlas discovers something, phaser might be able to control it. Um, okay. Um, we looked at heavy neutral light constants, there are neutrinos, which is the main reason why, um, why SHIP was uh, considered in the first place. And SHIP is designed to produce a ton of uh, D mesons. And it does. It doesn't do so well with B mesons. Actually, LHC will produce all of 10 times more, 10 to 100 times more B mesons than SHIP. 
why should we produce all our 10 to 100 times more D mesons? Um, and if you, if you look at the spectrum here, so this is what, uh, what uh, for one particular model where we basically have a, a sterile neutrino with around two masses and uh, some mixing angle, which is all about 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 ish, between the uh, muon and the uh, muon and the new state. Um, <coughs> then, um, yeah, you can see we do way, way worse than SHIP uh, and other proposed experiments like even Dune, uh, which is not designed at all to look for those states. Uh, and the D meson spectrum uh, uh, for the for the B meson region, since all the other experiments beside LHC and uh, the beam dump at the SPS in this case uh, are the only ones who are really able to probe the spectrum uh, where it comes from uh, E meson decay. You can actually do a, a relatively good job there. Um, and the well, again not as good as shit, but uh, at least close some sort of gap between all the searches uh, at lower energies and the uh, more prompt type of search in all the space searches at Atlas and, uh, and CMS. Okay, um, again for this, at least in this region that comes from email on decay, we have the same problem as the dark case that we ideally would want to have a bigger detector um, to be able to, to really get the entire spectrum. Meson decays. We also look at alpha decay. Okay, um, so axon-like particles uh, with production mechanism we consider. This is pretty cool. So you have a photon hitting the target neutral absorber and producing an axon-like particle, um, which uh, okay, you have an offshore photon here in the T channel, and uh, you have some form factor suppression here. So this axon-like particle has basically the momentum of the incoming photon. The, you have a lot of those photons from neutral pion decay, and the, it's basically the pion spectrum I showed earlier can be very forward, so you might have a relatively large uh, flux of axon-like particles going forward. Um, and let's imagine we put uh, the axon-like particle with the decay into the photon, uh, into photons, uh, let's imagine we could uh, measure those, for example, by putting an additional decal at the end of our detector, uh, we might be able to uh, also constrain axon-like particles. Uh, okay, this of course needs uh, all the more careful detector considerations. You might worry, okay, do you really need to detect two photons if you probably want to, to be sure that it was really an axon-like particle? And this actually does not decrease the speed so much if you have pressing what I can show you later. But yeah, this is maybe something you want to keep in mind that in the long term, you want to also put phase out with some sort of, of decal, which also has a lot of advantages for, for the other searches as well. Okay, um, so we can basically probe all the typical long lived scenarios people are thinking about. Uh, there are probably much more. We are thinking about more things. We, um, uh, yeah. One thing we are thinking about is, hey, can we also do a neutrinos? All those models might be true or might be not true, more likely not than that they are true, uh, but uh, neutrinos are certainly there. Everyone believes in neutrinos. So what is if you have a forward tau neutrino interacting with our detector producing three charged ions? Uh, can we see that? We didn't do that yet, so this is just a, uh, what we are planning to do next, but I think there might be also completely different physics opportunities here in, for example, neutrino physics. Okay, let me conclude since the time is already over. Um, so I told you that uh, we, um, the LHC produces a lot of particles in the forward direction. And those standard model particles could, for example, decay uh, into longer particles, and we could have for example, LHC as a dark photon factory without knowing it. Um, so our idea is to, uh, to use this opportunity and place a small cheap detector in the side tunnel that I showed you um, and look for the case of those long particles within the detector. 
I would have a striking signature of multi TV tracks uh, in in this relatively quiet uh, uh, yeah detector environment. Um, detector doesn't even have to be so complicated. Some sort of tracking system with like three, four, five layers and a weak magnetic field would be sufficient, and we could probe a bunch of models, let's say dark photons, dark photons, and so on. Um, Right now, we reached a stage where um, we got experimentalists and interest, uh, experimentalists interested. So some of them start to do a background study using like uh, dedicated tools like Flickr to, uh, to actually predict what the background source uh, will be. Um, we hope that after this is done, maybe within a month or so, to put a beam of novelty and monitor into the side panel and just measure what the uh, particle fluxes are. This could be done relatively easily and cheaply. Uh, um, the LAC infrastructure section does it all the time, and uh, they said it would be no problem to just move one of those there. In like one of the shutdowns in summer, you shut it down for a week and then put it there. You shut it down anyway, so you can certainly do that. And then only before the end of the summer, this entire background discussion should be uh, yeah, should have my new input. Um, we're starting to do actual geo force simulations to study the detector design acceptance and I was a little bit hand wavy on how the detector is supposed to look like and I did that by purpose. I didn't want to tell the experimentalist we really need this and you're not supposed to change this. No, we want the experimentalist to build the detector for us because they actually know what they're doing. Um, we want to explore uh, more physics opportunities, more models, uh, Maybe neutrinos. Um, yeah, so if you have uh, suggestions, new ideas, if you have a favorite model that you wonder if it would work in the context of phaser, um, let me know. If you think that something I said you don't believe, I'm happy to discuss it. If you have uh, think about the background that you think we didn't consider, let me know. We should uh, be happy to, uh, to, to think about that. Um, yeah, so any sort of feedback is very welcome. So thank you for listening and uh, thank you for inviting me. We have time for questions. So can you distinguish one model from the other? Ah, well, with enough statistics, possibly. For example, mm. let's say you have a dark Higgs. It has a much different uh, PT spectrum than a dark photon. So all in all, okay, this is more a statement of mass, but uh, um, might also have different final states. So for example, say you have a 500 MeV uh, particle. If it's only elect or, or mostly electrons, it's probably a dark photon. If it's mostly pions, it's a stage, it's probably a dark case. So yeah, you probably have enough information Except you only have three events, then maybe not. So 50 meters of matter is enough even for very high energy neutrons, right? Well, the typical uh, interaction range is in, uh, in rock, it's, I think, 20 centimeters, plus minus, I don't know, but uh, this is exponential, right? So after uh, 50 meters, you have e to the minus uh, 250 suppression. Yeah. Uh, I think that. Uh, that yeah, but, but like for, for, for ionization, there are those. those um, what, what do you call those those graphs? Ionization um, with energy. Um, I, I forget, but you know, th there's an energy range where your ionization is. No, we optimal. just look at the model TV energy range, right? And that's okay. that okay. because everything that's below the GeV, and this is where all those funny effects happen, right? Um, that shouldn't be a background. If that's a background, then we have a problem, right? Because then we have have to worry about all those low energy neurons that are flying around everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but we are care we care about a high energy stuff. Of course, that requires us to build a detector that can distinguish high from low energy, which is why, for example, I would like to have a magnetic field um, or an ECAL, but one of us, one of them, I think, we definitely need. Um, Okay. And is this as cheap as it's 
uh, ah. the sounds or my magic sounds? Okay, so of course I'm a serious. I have no idea how much this costs. But uh, the plan is it should not be more than let's say five million. Five million, I say, because my hand has five fingers. But, uh, no, um, it should be uh, it should be cheap. If it would be fifty million, no one will build it because then you can just build a better, bigger detector. Then it's not worth it. So we need to make it cheap. Um, we asked this, these experimentalists and the guy who, who sent us the pictures with the uh, with the CMOS shifts. He said. Well, we could use them because they are lying around everywhere. We just produced many of them, and some of them have like small effects here and there. That's why we don't want to use them in Alice. But I guess you guys don't care about the one percent of the pixels don't work properly. That's not a big problem for, for us. For Alice, it might be. So we can just uh, yeah, benefit from the from the production of all those much bigger experiments. Um, and we might even be able to recycle other Lots of other experiments, but mainly just yeah. If we need like a, like ten percent of the area from Atlas and CMS, you can probably just use the ten percent of uh, pieces that they produced that didn't work uh, work with their standards. Um, so that's our hopes that using that we can make it cheap. Um, for example, for the uh, for the chips that uh, we are considering now, now we actually switch to silicon strip detector because. Or experimental stuff to like some more now, and they said, um, I think they said it's a million dollars per square meter if we would actually produce it. Um, we don't really need the square meter. Okay, if we need to have a one meter detector, then we might need the square meter, but then for the outer parts, we don't need 20 microns uh, resolution. You have a 5 GB dark X DK and you don't need 20 microns, then you you only need two millimeter, and then you don't need the silicon strip detectors anymore. Then you can use a, a much older, much worse technology, um, which will be also much cheaper. So yeah, I think the tracking system itself, okay, maybe a million. Then okay, you have all the stuff around that you would need, uh, like the cooling system, the data system, the magnet system. And probably that costs more than I think it would, but uh, yeah, I have, I can't really answer the, this question, but. Uh, yeah, I think we need to make it cheap. Otherwise, if we can't make it cheap, it will never be done. Okay, are uh, there any other questions? Okay, we'll have our usual talk chat upstairs. Feel free to grab your coffee and join us in the fourth floor discussion room. Otherwise, just thank the speaker. Room.